Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect podcast, episode 29. The purpose of this podcast is to take high-level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano space and break them down into bite-sized, consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. We have Rick online as well, and Sebastian is not joining us today. He will join us soon, but it's Rick and I today. Um, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping things. If you missed episode 27, we had Marcus Herney on, and he is the front-end developer for Daedalus, so check that out if you're interested. And episode 28, we had Hoshoshi, or Forrest. He has a YouTube channel where he explores various different cryptocurrency and blockchain projects, and he has recently done a Plutus review, so go check that out as well. It was a great episode. And today we have a few special, a couple of special guests today who Rick will be introducing very shortly. And I think this episode is going to be particularly interesting for the Cardano community. It is a little different, the topic that we're covering today. And I think people will be happy. I don't want to spoil the episode before it starts. So that being said, I want to warn everyone that none of what we say on this podcast is financial advice. You are your best financial advisor. And if you don't think you are, you need to find someone who's qualified to do so. You're not going to find that here. So take that with a grain of salt and watch this episode and enjoy. We hope you enjoy. And with that being said, I'm going to pass the mic over to Rick. Rick, how are you doing this morning? What's going on? Hey, good morning, Philippe. I'm doing very well this morning. Today's uh, May 11th, Saturday morning. And what's going on is there's some good news coming from IOHK this morning. IOHK tweeted out that they are excited to share today. IOHK has signed a memorandum of understanding with the Mongolian Blockchain Technology and Cryptocurrency Association and the Mongolian Fintech Association. This MOU is to help implement and foster blockchain project developments and education in Mongolia. More information coming soon. So more developments there. So Ethiopia and now Mongolia, that's great stuff. A reminder to the viewers that, that this podcast is available on Google Play, SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify. Uh, use your favorite app to view it there. Now, I would like to go over to our guests. We have two guests today who work together, both from uh, different organizations, but they're working on the same projects or similar projects. And that's Mr. Umed Saidov, founder and CEO of Oculent. And Umed Saidov established Oculent in 2016 after spending more than 10 years investing in global infrastructure projects with the International Finance Corporation and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Umed is a CFA charter holder and author of the CFA Institute Enterprising Investor, or author at, and he received his MBA from INS EAD and holds a bachelor's degree in general management. Our other guest, Elliot Zareski williams He's a chief scientist at Seritech, Seri Technologies. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from the University of Maryland and is pursuing his PhD from University of Maryland. And he's used an advanced mathematical background and creative programming skills to create several proprietary machine learning programs. He's involved with AI. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being on the program today. How are you all doing and where are you calling in from? Hi, Rick. Uh, um, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I am uh, calling from uh, uh, Washington, D.C. area. I'm based in Maryland. Hi, Rick. Thanks for having me. I'm also uh, based uh, outside of D.C. Uh, in Maryland, not too far from Umed, actually. Thanks for having me. All right. And thank you guys for being on the program. And so um, what we're going to start with, since this, you guys work in the financial industry, and Umed Saidov, his company is called Oculent. Um, what does Oculent do? What's the general idea of the company? So um, just to give you a little bit of background of, about Oculent, um, um, I, I, I quit my job in 2015 um, to pursue sort of an, uh, an entrepreneurial uh, sort of uh, streak in me that I had um, uh, boiling for a long time. Um, so uh, I, I opened the Oculent as, as a registered investment advisor. I had some funds from family and friends uh, and managed those. Um, in 2017, I got exposed to cryptocurrencies as uh, as, uh, as a banker, um, as somebody from a financial industry who are very much uh, trained to be skeptical about everything new, everything that just uh, is flashy. Uh, I was in the same camp. But um, after having spent a lot of time trying to understand the technology behind blockchain um, and, and, and how it could ultimately create value, um, uh, I, I came to a conclusion that uh, this is something that, uh, uh, that may have a long-term effect on, on the economic landscape of the world in general. It's such a fundamental technology. Um, and ever since, um, 
I, I found that out um, on my own, doing my own research. Um, I uh, repurposed my company to uh, to serve the investment community uh, in uh, in uh, explaining to them and educating to them what these crypto assets are and how to value them. Um, so the, the 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 goal of of Oculent as it stands today um, uh, is to uh, explain, to educate, and to provide analytical tools for the users out there for investors out there to make intelligent investment decisions. And uh, um, to augment that, uh, we have brought in Seritech to help us develop AI-based solutions in order to uh, help sophisticated investors make uh, timely calls, um, make uh, uh, reduce their portfolio risk or enhance their returns um, as they see fit, um, uh, you know, choosing from different uh, range of AI um, solutions that may, we might have um, uh, on our platform. All right. Thank you for that. I admire your pioneering spirit to be able to go out there and start a business. Now, you mentioned Seritech. So can you tell us a little bit more about Seritech for um, Elliot, please? Yes, of course. So Seri Technologies, uh, I joined last year, about one year, one year ago exactly. And Seri Technologies now currently is an AI company. And we have essentially two routes to profit and the first way is AI through service, where we have clients like Ume. We, we essentially develop projects for them using our proprietary algorithms that I myself developed over the course of last year. And then the second the second platform we're working on is called Neuralist. And this is a essentially a very high-level software platform that allows people who do not have coding experience or let's say, you know, detailed machine learning experience to implement full-scale models. Uh, sort of like an alter, a user-friendly layperson alternative to the popular software known as TensorFlow, which is more geared towards machine learning developers. And the idea is that a lot of small businesses don't really know how to apply AI, even though they really, really want to. They try to go to talks. They try to they try to understand what's happening with AI, but they keep they keep being told the technical aspects of it, and they don't understand how to apply it to business. And here's where Seritech through Neuralist, our platform, comes in and helps them implement these models without really knowing how to code or really the detailed mathematics behind it. At the same time, if you are a seasoned machine learning engineer and you want to develop a really cool app, we provide very, very useful tools to do that in a very efficient manner. Wow, that's pretty amazing stuff. You know, most of the people that I work with in this space, I, um, I'm a speculator. You guys are professionals in the financial industry. And a lot of the folks that Philippe and I work with, um, we, we talk with on social media, our YouTube channels, Reddit, Telegram, Twitter, and stuff like that. Um, we're, not, we're not pros. Are your clients basically the businesses, small businesses, medium-sized businesses? Right. Uh, we're trying to target mostly mid medium-sized businesses uh, and mostly small businesses for now. As we develop the platform more extensively and we have a product fully ready to go, with big businesses certainly could be customers. But that's something that we're going to explore l later on once we have all the, the, the platform launched. We're still a little ways away from that, but we have made a lot of progress on it. Yeah. Uh, about Oculent, uh, if you ask me, um, the... Uh... The platform that we're developing is both consumer facing uh it has a consumer uh, uh, facing sort of part of it where you don't have to get as complicated as uh, uh let's say institutional investors um and and it has also uh, a set of tools that could be useful for uh financial advisors for instance or for uh pension funds who want to reallocate their portfolio and see how addition of, of uh, the addition of digital assets would uh, ultimately affect their expected return or risk um, uh, the, 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 the risk allocation of their portfolio and uh, um, in that regard I would I would I would say that uh, the, the reason why I started developing this platform is because uh, when I entered the space uh, I I was just blown away by the lack of uh, depth and rigor um, in, in this in, 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 in the crypto space. Um, and what it prompted me is, uh, was, was uh, the fact that uh, a lot of people might be led by uh, uh, a, a lot of un unscrupulous minds who have their own sort of agenda um, to, uh, to recommend or, you know, uh, as, as you say, shell the coins and whatnot. Um, and uh, I wanted to basically develop a platform that could give you a fundamental analysis of, of things that we look at and uh, the logical steps that you could follow in order to make your own uh, uh, mind. But uh, the fact that our platform will will have these and, and have uh, a transparency to just basically uh, 
question any of our assumptions. Um, I, we hope that will uh, create a, a lot of value for, for uh, an individual investor. That being said, I wanted to say that uh, I personally do own ADA. So uh, whatever I say in this, in this podcast should, should not be construed as financial advice or unbiased financial advice. Um, um, and and uh, users and, and uh, risk listeners uh, should, should um, uh, conduct their own research. That's great yes. to hear. That's great to hear. So, Umed, I wanted to follow up. So, let's try to break this down from top to bottom, and we're going to work our way up to really delve into the economics behind Cardano. So, you are you have a CFA license, which is extremely difficult to to get. I mean, this is one of the licenses on Wall Street, which um, it's like one of the top licenses on Wall Street. It's a chartered financial analyst, and it takes uh, many years and many hours of studying. So congratulations <laughs> for getting that, because the failure rate is pretty high. And you. You, al you also have to have experience in the field on top of all of that. So yeah. that is a, it's not something to scoff at whatsoever. So what exactly, can you explain to people what exactly a chartered financial analyst is? And who are your clients? Yes, um, th thank you um, uh, for, for, for the nice words. Um, I, I have to say that, um, uh, yes, financial, a charter financial analyst is, is, uh, is, is a, uh, a certification that uh, the fin financial professionals um, uh, do get um, if, they, if they pass all the three levels, if they can do that. Um, and uh, um, it, it's, it's a pretty rigorous uh, um, curriculum that covers pretty much everything um, that you can think of in, in, in the financial uh, industry. Um, very in-depth, uh, the, the, the exams are six, six hours long, each of them. Um, and uh, the failure rate, as you said, is pretty high. Um, um, in terms of uh, um, so financial analysts, if, if, if so a certified financial analyst, um, what it stands for um, is is rigor. What it stands for is ethical conduct, uh, and it it, uh, it it and 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 trust in 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 the in in knowing that uh, somebody who has that designation um, is is has your uh, best interest at heart um, and uh, will not. Uh, work against you if if they are hired as as your portfolio managers and such and so, so forth because this uh, um, uh, exam is so hard to get and because we have high ethical standards uh, and and the ethical standards that they are uh, expected to uh, uphold it is a it's, it's an industry standard upheld by many uh, financial institutions around the world. So when you're dealing with a client or customer and you're ha helping them handle their money like you're treating that money as if it's your own. Yes. Um, so um, j just to clarify here, um, I, I am not at this point handling money um, or, uh, 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 you know, um, I am not a portfolio manager at this point, um, even though I, I could be working in that industry. Um, uh, the, the direction I chose to uh, to apply myself at, at this point in time is to take that rigor that have accumulated over the years, 10 years and, the, the, you know, the financial CFA curriculum to be that uh, experience and apply it to uh, to understanding uh, digital assets, to explaining digital assets, and to um, to uh, analyzing the the performance and, and the upside and the correlations of the assets within the portfolio of investors who might want to add them later in life, um, in later uh, you know this year, maybe next year. Um, the you asked a good question about who who might. Um, clients are um, uh, the first tire that we well first of all we, we are developing this platform that aggregates all the information uh, and and filters all the information uh, about uh, digital assets so um, if you're a typical uh, you know digital asset investor crypto investor what are your sources of information it's uh, Twitter uh, it's Reddit, and uh, there's a lot of uh, fud out there, um, and you don't know if uh, things are real or not. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that link th that leads to a lot of swings in price. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty around things. Uh, there's a lot of false information, as we have seen with Cardano in particular, um, that cannot be fought effectively until we have uh, uh, authoritative uh, sources of information that basically people uh, trust and, uh, and 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 that's what Oculate is trying to create um, a, uh, a, a source of single source for quality information where uh, the user would just go for instance in, in our platform 
and enter his or her uh, uh, portfolio tickers, and the platform will just filter through the noise and present them with all the in relevant information that that uh, needs to be um, digested, let's so to say, um, by by the user. Um, and uh, you know, we are working on 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 this platform to 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 make it available uh, as soon as possible. I think maybe June is is our uh, you know, a date for release of the beta. Um, and um, yeah, at the second tier um, of, of this platform is geared toward professional investors uh, or professional man managers. Um, and it's more uh, sophisticated in the sense that uh, it, it looks at uh, uh, expected returns, standard deviation, risk metrics, correlations, uh, things that the, the uh, average investor may not want to no, or if they want to know, they want to ask their uh, uh, a financial advisor uh, to look at those within the, cor uh, the, the portfolio that they have uh, currently. So uh, the idea here is that uh, financial advisors um, might need uh, a source of information where they could look, let's say that my client is a 60-year-old uh, um, um, uh, teacher that is about to retire, uh, and I want to know if uh, adding a Bitcoin at 1% of the portfolio value uh, will add, add value to the portfolio um, in, in medium to long term. And, and that is basically a mathematical uh, exercise that is done by our portfolio uh, analysis tool in the back, in the back, in, in the back um, uh, background. So, um, and then we have the third tier, which is going to be a, uh, um, um, a fully automated uh, um, stream a stream of information that that uh, is basically of interest for hedge funds and institutional investors that are actively trading in the market. Um, those are the things that we are working with uh, Elliot to to define at this point. Um, uh, they're not yet ready, uh, but we're looking forward to uh, developing them into full fledged products later on. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And yeah, so the main product is that research and analysis documentation that describes, you know, why something has value. So yes, right. clarify that. Yes. So right. um, that, that being said, we will have a free version of, of our product where um, it, it, the user can, can go and uh, uh, enter their portfolio. Um, they will get uh, periodic updates um, and alerts if there's some significant news that pertains to their portfolio. If they want to uh, act on it, it's up to them. But uh, it, it, it's supposed to be more of a proactive tool that will let them know if there's something significant is happening uh, that involves the assets in their portfolio. Uh, we'll have a mobile app with that. Um, and, uh, and and as as the user wants to 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 get into more uh, uh, so sort of sophisticated things, uh, he can opt in to to buy the 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 uh, what we call this uh, Skylight uh, is our the name of our platform. Um, we call it Skylight uh, um, Core, which will have uh, an extra features um, for um, for the users to to benefit from. Um, so yeah. Okay. Okay. So I have a follow up question. So um, are you, you're the closest guest that we've had to understand exactly what's going on with financial institutions? You have an inside look of their interest in cryptocurrency, in blockchain, um, because of the nature of your work. So what the work you're doing, are you a trailblazer or is it something like the financial institutions are, are all setting up to get into cryptocurrency, to get into blockchain? Is this something that you are leading forward or is it like the news said, no one has really entered the space? Yes, I mean, it's, it's, uh... When I entered the space uh, in in late 2017, uh, it was less of a um, um, a thing uh, than it is now. Um, I um, I mean, if 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 you ask me at that point in time, I, I I would I would find myself a little bit on on the side of people who who uh, would be in the minority um, in among financial professionals. Um, and that is uh, it, it is totally understandable. Um, it it takes a while for the new information to propagate through any network. Um, and when you come up with a new way of settling money, a new way of generating value, 
um, it is a natural, especially in the financial industry, in the banking industry, it is very natural for them to be skeptical, skeptical because they've seen it all. Um, and that's what we are trained to do, just basically be skeptical until proven wrong, right? Um, and and in, in many cases, it's, it's, an, it's a lazy, um, I wouldn't say lazy, I, I would say, yeah, it's, it's, it's an easy way to, to, uh, to protect your do uh, downside. Um, but in the case of blockchain, I, I'm convinced that it is, uh, you know, those people who, 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 who do not understand it or do not, uh, those some financial professionals who do not understand it or do not want to understand it might uh, be leaving some, some, some of the upside on, on, on the table if, uh, or because that's where the future is going. Um, now, what the future will look like uh, um, in terms of the landscape in the future, uh, landscape, uh, is, is still up for grabs, whether it's going to be all open source or whether it's going to be uh, uh, blockchains uh, uh, controlled by the governments. I think that's where we're going to go. Um, the is, is still, still, you know, unknown. Um, but um, in terms of um, where I stand right now, I was a trailblazer before maybe, um, but now I know that uh, you know, as as I entered the space, the CFA uh, Institute, for instance, has introduced a, a, a section. I remember last year um, on cryptocurrencies on their on on, on their exam. Um, it's it's a big big deal. Um, so uh, we know that recently uh, the Fidelity um, uh, survey has has produced what. The 70, 74 percent of uh, um, uh, financial advisors view it. Uh, view, you know, they they think that they're going to enter the um, a cryptocurrency space with uh, with their uh, portfolio allocations. I mean, that's that's a huge positive upswing in in terms of sentiment. And I think uh, the information is getting propagated at this point uh, to uh, to uh, to a level where people are feeling more comfortable, or they understand where uh, blockchain could create value. Um, that it's not a fad. That it's not something that uh, has been created to scam people or whatnot. Now, now I'm, not, I'm not saying that there aren't bad actors. There are plenty of bad actors, and I've seen uh, plenty of pitches in, in in these forums and whatnot and conferences uh, uh, that that clearly did not make sense. Um, but if if you do not understand the technology, if you do not feel uh, that that uh, you completely grasp the, the value that it could generate. You might you might make some mistakes of putting your money in, in, in these uh, um, endeavors, and um, maybe uh, you know that's that. But that that's that's the risk that people will will will, will take uh, at this point. But um, yeah, but to to uh, take all these bad actors and just say you know the whole blockchain space is 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 fraud is just a, it's a little bit of a too far far fetched uh, claim, I would say. Okay. Okay. And does the same apply to Elliot? Elliot, are you trailblazing in this in this blockchain space? Because you have a slightly different background than Umed. Right. I would say to some extent, yes, because I'm sure that there has been there have been projects where AI is going to apply to crypto to an extent. But like Umed said, I don't think there's any product out there right now where we have a very central platform where we could do we have analytics on all the top ten coins. And, it's, and we have all the information anyone would possibly need all in one place. People have to go to different websites. That's not really clean. And they don't really get much beyond the raw data. We're providing a lot of analytics for it. And so to speak to the AI portion of it, uh, we're doing, we're using AI. So like we said, we're going to cut through a lot of the noise. We're trying to filter out bad information. And we're trying to have users make educated decisions on how to manage their portfolios. It's not to say that we're going to just... Their recommendations. They're not just. We're not just going to have the user just trust trust AI fully because that's just silly financial advice. But we're going to have it be where we're going to give them a lot of useful information and then they can make better decisions off of it. There are a lot of factors that affect cryptocurrencies uh, that that affect the price. I should say, I should say specifically. You know, we have. Um, what's going on in the blockchain, uh, you know, the amount of volume that's going through these blocks, uh, that how much cost it takes for each block to uh, hop, what the transactions costs are for transferring crypto from one block to the next. And there's certainly it's a very exciting space to be in. There are a lot of factors to consider, tons of metrics that are relevant to the price, and all these metrics need to be analyzed in some way. And that's where the AI portion of it comes in. Okay. Okay. Mm. I understand. Um, so... I want to shift gears and go back to Umed. Um, I met you at the IOHK Summit, and you are a Cardano fan, I'm assuming. You know, from what we, we our initial conversation. 
So why Cardano? What led you to Cardano out of all the other blockchain projects that are out there? What is it with this project that makes it so special and makes it stand out? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question, uh, Philippe, because um, when I entered the, the space, I, I as, as somebody who's rigorous in his uh, approach to research, um, I looked for information. I looked for information about blockchain. I, I spent hours, days, months trying to understand this technology. And, and I, I do have some coding skills, so I try to basically see um, how does that uh, what what I'm hearing actually makes sense from a from a from a uh, you know a computer code perspective, and um, and what I found was that uh, the information or um, if it is available, it's scattered around the world, um, and it's not very user friendly. It's not very uh, um, open, um, and uh, it requires that you know a lot from the get go. Um, and this as soon as I stumbled across Cardano, I, I realized that this project has the level of openness and the level of talent uh, and the level of vision that is articulated that is unparalleled in this space. So um, those three sort of um, uh, boxes have been ticked from the get-go. From, uh, from my perspective, it was a treasure trove of information, which led me to to do a deep dive on 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 Cardano to understand, you know, okay, Charles is talking about uh, uh, Africa. You know, does that make sense? How does it make sense? You know, is it possible technically? If it's possible, what needs to be in place for that to happen? Um, and and uh, you know, we we wrote a report. I wrote a report about Cardano's valuation, minimum valuation, because you know the upside is pretty much unlimited. You know, it, once the platform becomes fully decentralized it's it's up to the community to take it anywhere they want um and that's that's the thing with fundamental technologies you never know uh where they go so um to 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 answer your question succinctly i would say uh that um it's just the the level of transparency the level of professionalism and the, the level of of vision that that has been articulated with cardano that makes it easy to evaluate its uh its uh you know potential um and uh and look at at, at things that might uh, uh you know um go wrong because because of the fact that you have that information you can look at it cr critically uh whereas other things you know ethereum um i haven't looked at ethereum in a long in a long time but um early on when i looked at it it's um it was difficult to understand what is it that they are trying to achieve um and i understood that you know it's, it wants to be a computer for the world but um Beyond that, there was not a whole lot of direction in the platform, and 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 if you don't have a direction, you don't have a lot of traction to to make edu educated uh, analysis, uh, educated guesses in, in our case uh, to to come up with some sort of a value range for a coin. So um, that that got me really excited about Cardano, and uh, as soon as I got into the community, I, I found that it's it's a uh, it's a it's an educated bunch of individuals who are really passionate about uh, the cause. And, um, you know, it, Card Cardano's cause is very much close to my heart because I spent 10 years in, in uh, development finance. It's, it's pretty much different than whatever finance you, you, can, you can think of. You know, the types of projects I used to do were um, uh, building a bridge or, you know, uh, financing a toll road or uh, financing a water uh, system, sewage system in, in countries where there's no, not a whole lot, uh, to, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, present, um, Mongolia was actually in, in one of the countries I used to cover with EBRD. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of funny that, that, uh, you know, Charles is going to all these countries and, and I'm kind of, this is saying to myself that it's kind of a parallel, uh, uh, you know, we, we have parallel lives in a way that I used to do that, uh, from a, um, the development finance point of view, uh, uh, trying to basically develop infrastructure. And Charles is doing the same, but uh, he's uh, trying to build the IT infrastructure for for these uh, for these countries. Um, it's it's fascinating. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so let's move on to the economics of ADA. Where, what, what, it's it's hard to speculate exactly. I'm, we know what gives it value: people trading on and off various different exchanges. How does that ever change? And you know what exactly will give ADA value in the future? And it there are a lot of uh, moon boys and moon girls out there in the Twitter sphere. Um, so that aside, 
what is special about ADA and what wh what's its potential? Not so much as a price range, but where where can it grow? Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm really glad you uh, you actually asked this question because there's um, a clear distinction between the price and the value, um, and then there's a clear distinction between uh, the, the short term and the long term. Um, and what you see in the market is basically, uh, you know, markets, what, what they do is they, they help you discover the price. And, and depending on who is active on the market, you might have a price that is uh, intelligent, uh, you know, fully uh, reflecting its, uh, its value or not. Um, I mean, I, I tend to think that the uh, crypto market is a little bit immature just because of the fact that the players that are in it are either uh, very, uh, you know, a, a lot of individuals. And I, I, I remember reading a, a report back in the day that was like 80% uh, individual investors um, that do not have a clear understanding of what they're buying or selling. It's just basically based on speculation and moving averages, TA. Um, that in and of itself does not in, in my view, does not carry a lot of uh, uh, rigor, um, analytical rigor. Now, <clears throat> the value, uh, as opposed to price that you see on, on the market, is, is, is has a completely different uh, properties to it. Uh, to, to understand the value, the fundamental value of, 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 of an asset, you have to just step back and think about um, what gives it value, right? In the case of um, protocols, um, even though it's really hard to value them at this point, but you, I realize that we have to come up with new frameworks to evaluate them. And that's what we are trying to achieve at Oculent to uh, try to find a new way of looking at these um, um, platforms to see you know, what is their full capacity to produce value and, uh, and what do they need to do in order to get there. Um, that being said, um, um, for a fundamental technology like Cardano, um, uh, I would say the sky's the limit in that respect because uh, the, the applications um, of, of blockchain technology are uh, not yet even fully understood. Um, one thing that I try to basically drive home when I, when I talk about the value of blockchain um, with my friends, with my uh, colleagues, is, is the interview that uh, um, uh, Bill Gates gave to uh, um, David Letterman back in the day. It was 1995, and internet was just just coming up, right? Um, and David Letterman asks uh, Bill Gates, you know, it's oh, I heard about this internet. You know, what is it all about? And and um, Bill Gates, knowing what the potential of internet was at that point, um, he uh, uh, you know describes it. But even uh, even him being the insider, uh, he. He, he missed it. He missed how big, how enormous, and how essential internet is going to be. Um, and if you do the parallels between the blockchain and internet, uh, you will see that whatever we're thinking about blockchain at this point uh, is a, as, as a use case or the ultimate use case is going to be dwarfed in comparison with, with whatever will come later because it's such a fundamental technology. Moving, moving value uh, just like moving information is 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 as important and as fundamental to uh, building great things and to making uh, the, the the world a more interconnected uh, and, and to ca capturing a lot of uh, business potential. So that's where the value of of Cardano and, and the protocols like that will have uh, will come from. Now, will Cardano achieve this better than anybody else? Um, I sure would hope so because they have the talent and and and, and the vision and and I I, would, I I hope the strategy to actually pursue this dream or this this type of development. Um, um, and but but again, you know, there's uh, Ethereum, there's EOS that uh, is is competing for the for the for the same sort of uh, type of uh, things. Um, and and it won't be easy for. On one one uh, sort of platform to take it all, um, but uh, definitely focusing on on what's important and de delivering you know solutions is 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 uh, is is the best way to, to secure that value. Umed, you just did one of the deepest dives into what gives a cryptocurrency value that I've ever heard. Um, that was great, and so it kind of leads me to another question. I want to go over to Elliot about the AI, but you led me to another question. One of the most common questions that I usually get 
in the workplace, in the workplace, or from amongst my friends, from the non cryptocurrency people, what I call normal people, mm -hmm. um, is the question is why is cryptocurrency worth money? They compare it to a dollar bill printed on paper. They compare it to a plastic credit card. And that's what they ask. Do, do you have an opinion on that? Either of you guys, do you have an opinion? Why is cryptocurrency even worth anything? Yeah, it, it's an excellent question, uh, Rick. Um, just, just to explain where um, I derive my uh, uh, sort of um, views on, on cryptocurrency, I would like to say that when I entered the space, I, I saw that there's a lot of hype around a lot of stuff. There's a lot of uh, false information and, you know, uh, there was a lot of people who were over, z z z uh, you know, the zealots um, in the space. Um, and I wanted to just step back and say, you know, what is the, what is, what is money, right? Um, you know, it's kind of funny that me as somebody who has been in the financial industry for 10 years and 10 plus years uh, is asking that question. But uh, to, to be honest with you, we, we don't even ask that question ourselves. It's just money is money. It's just uh, um, given to you uh, and, and you operate within those constraints. But um, I read, um, you know, I cannot recommend that that author author enough, uh, Jack Weatherford. Um, he has written a book, I believe it's called A History of Money. And he wrote it in 1999. He just basically looks at the evolution of money uh, from an anthropological point of view. And it just looks at it as, as a social phenomena. Um, and it's, it's just in stark contrast with what um, we, the, the financial folks, uh, are, are accustomed to seeing money as. Um, and you will see that uh, the way the money has evolved is that uh, it used to be stones, it used to be coffee, it used to be based on commodities, and then all of a sudden something what called the, the, what's called the tokenized um, uh, form of money, which is gold, uh, um, sort of all of a sudden emerged as, as a standard. Um, and, and then from that point of view, uh, from that point on, governments took over the, 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 the uh, ability to, to stamp money and, and produce money and whatnot. Um, but even then, the, the the commodity itself was hard to uh, come by. So uh, inflation actually was born in that in 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 um, in in Great Rome, basically back in the day, where the the emperors would say, "Okay, just file off some some you know the, the edges of some coins in the treasury, and then make more coins." And then people actually caught up with that, and then adjusted the value of the coin according to uh, how much was uh, was taken off the coins. Um, so. To answer to, to 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 answer your long to to make my long answer short, um, money has no intrinsic value in and of itself. Um, anything that you see in the world has no intrinsic value. It's something. Um, any I would say any any monetary unit uh, in and of itself uh, has no intrinsic value. And the 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 thing that gives it value is the ability of the governments to basically say. Um, this is money, and I want uh, my taxes to be paid in it. Um, and and the system that basically says uh, I want, uh, you know, this this is legal tender. Um, so in the United States, uh, strangely enough, legal tender does not does not only, uh, as far as I know, uh, is not, is is not only uh, the uh, the U.S. dollars you could pay with anything you want. That's why you know paying taxes with Bitcoin is possible. Um, in other countries, that is not um, unfortunately the case. You know where the governments uh, pretty much uh, impose uh, the the local currency on their population and say, you know, this is the only thing that you can uh, within the borders of this country you can you can use to to uh, to exchange um, value for uh, for money. Um, now that being said, there is a case to be made for um, money to exist outside of the realm of governments. Um, and that's uh, that, that, that's a really particularly hard um, argument to make because we're living in, in, in advanced economies where the rule of law and, and, and the institutions make everything easy, everything possible. Um, that, that is not the case in, in, in other countries that are going through a turmoil. Or the the governments are not as uh, as uh, democratic, or uh, you know, um, uh, the ones that that uh, do not, you know, respect the rights of their citizens. So those are the places where an ex extrinsic or a, a an external source of money uh, could uh, become pretty uh, valuable. I would say, 
because um, they present a way for the population to uh, to uh, preserve their wealth outside of the of their uh, f- financial systems that I, that, that are um, that that exist within those borders. Now, um, and so this is uh, just to, to ca- case in point. You know, um, I was born in Soviet Union, right? Uh, I I my my mom and dad basically were a middle class citizens, and all of a sudden in 1991. Uh, uh, the whole thing fell apart, and you know they had no money, and uh, they they had to. Uh, it's 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 a fascinating sort of history, uh, uh, economic history for uh, for for me at least to to go back to to understand what what money is and how it derives its value. And at that point, I would say that everybody took their life savings and put on carpets, cars, whatever things that they saw that that could become useful as store of value. Um, now, um, the reason why they did that was because uh, they realized that the money that they had in the bank, the, the pieces of paper were going to be worthless within two days, three days, because the government collapsed, the whole system collapsed. And um, they like, just imagine that you you have worked your, your butt off, uh, let's say, for you know 50 or 60 years, and you have a nice retirement fund, and then all of a sudden, you know, your government says, you know, by the way, uh, we're just reshuffling the whole thing, and you know, uh, you know, our currency is not going to be worth that much. So, um, uh, if you want, you can just go to your bank and uh, withdraw all your money. Um, so, what you do is just go to the bank, and yeah, banks, by the way, did not have all the money, um, so they had to stay, uh, you know, and in, in, in the line to to get their money. And if they got their money, it was just twenty percent of whatever they had. And put all of that into whatever they could find to buy um, as a store of value. Now, imagine if they had access to cryptocurrencies. Would not be so much easier. That would be the best way to preserve value, and I would say the best way to create uh, uh, a um, a counterbalance to excessive. Uh, sort of moves by the governments that would impoverish their uh, uh, population. So it's it's um, in the absence of, of of democracy, that's the next best thing the the cryptocurrencies could offer to countries that are totalitarian. Let's just put it that way. Um, to basically give them a, a, a way out if uh, things go really bad. Um, so yeah, that's that's. That's basically the 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 short uh, the long long answer to, to your question. Um, I want to I want to make a distinction here though, uh, Rick. Um, there is a difference between uh, Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrencies like Cardano, Ether, and EOS. And um, as I write in my report, that that is uh, available for downloading um, for for whoever is interested. Um, the Pure cryptocurrency plays are the easiest to create, but they are the hardest to defend and hardest to uphold. Um, and in this space, I think beyond Bitcoin, I, I don't think anybody else is going to be uh, successful in that regard, unless you know you attach some privacy sort of uh, um, um, features to them and say, you know, uh, in addition to being a coin, this this thing is also private. Um, but um, it's uh, Bitcoin and 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 pure coin. Uh, plays are completely different in the sense that they are nothing else but coins. Uh, they do not represent computation. They do not do anything else except for holding uh, holding the value or transferring value. Which, um, by the way, the the Cardano and Ethereum and EOS of the world do too. But in addition, they are capable of doing computation. Which actually brings me to my very interesting point that. Uh, these coins like Cardano, the platforms, they are the ones who are going to actually be able to eat the world in a sense. Just imagine um, that uh, you know the banking system, the way it works right now is that it hasn't permeated the whole society, the whole world. And there are many transactions that are happening um, off the current financial system that go undetected. Now, these platforms will allow people to transact on on transact on 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 uh, uh, very small scale and capture the value that way it creates value in addition to being the money it creates value it 
it reduces costs for the current solutions that exist. Um, and it also allows people to have a bank account uh, and, uh, you know, have a, a, a number of opportunities to, to, uh, to use the platform and it, the dApps that it will house to, uh, to conduct their businesses. And that's where its huge potential is. Um, I'm not saying that Bitcoin is not going to be as valuable as Cardano, uh, but Bitcoin has a different battle to, to, uh, to, uh, to fight. It's its main sort of uh, you know narrative at this point is the store of value, and it wants to capture you know X percent of uh, the the total market of gold or total market of of currencies. And uh, apart from just being currency, there isn't much to to uh, you know to argue for Bitcoin except for the fact that it is agreed that it is money, or people agree that it is money. Uh, whereas for Cardano, you can say, okay, this is um, a, a token that can transfer value, just like Bitcoin. It's stable, um, but it also can uh, be used to fuel transactions, fuel computations. That will be helpful for you as a business or as an individual to conduct within the realm of, of Cardano blockchain. I hope that this is not a, a too much of a deep answer, but you know that's yes. basically... I think that's a great answer. And yeah. I wanted to do a quick follow-up question because I think this segues into the next point perfectly. And this whole idea, you were telling us a story about your parents and you used to be in the Soviet Union. And then when it collapsed, they lost all their value or a majority of the value that they've been working their entire lives for. And, you know, I know in in the United States that it doesn't affect us as much, but it does affect people. I mean, look at pensions and look at various different, like you could just even look at like social security. People thought they, they were gonna get a lot more money out of the system when they retire. And it obviously isn't true. Most people do not have enough for retirement. And if you go to impoverished third world countries, their currency just drops off of cliffs. So moving forward, um, we have Cardano who is trying to bank the unbanked. We have an MOU in Ethiopia, and now we have an MOU in Mongolia. And these countries obviously aren't as affluent as the United States, and they may have lost a lot more value than the dollar has over the years. So when they're building their solutions, and there's been a whole debate about this because at the summit, Charles announced the project Atala and this whole idea of working with these governments, working with these institutions to build projects within the Cardano ecosystem, but they're not necessarily interacting with ADA. Can you go into what are your thoughts about how these projects, how a project with, let's say, the, um, the government within Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, how that could add value to ADA? How can that interact with people who are investing in ADA? Where is the link? And, you know, from what I've understood or from what has been explained, it's it's the gateway into our system. And it's going to allow us, it's going to allow people access to our system. You have to build a permissioned blockchain solution for a particular use case before they can interact with the permissionless. So what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, um, excellent question, excellent segue, um, as always, uh, Felipe. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the, when I wrote the report on Cardano, I, I was under the impression that everything that is going to be built is going to be built on the Cardano, uh, um, you know, uh, CL or SL. Um, obviously, things have changed a little bit. Um, I think we all have to understand that the markets change and uh, businesses need to be nimble enough to pivot. Um, I understand why Atala exists, and I understand why there is a need for Atala. Um, and having worked with governments myself for 10 years, right, these are very uh, conservative folks that are not going to just roll over and say, oh, wow, uh, you know, you have uh, a, Car a Cardano platform. Let me just uh, open up my whole financial system to you just because, you know, um, your child or whoever. Um, it's not going to happen. I mean, control is a very important issue. It's it, it's directly tied to the sovereign, um, and, and, you know, sovereignty of a nation. And you know, it's it's naive to think that you know so, somebody is going to come and and basically put all their information on an open blockchain um, and just let the open blockchain uh, lead the way. Um, 
So it's 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 a very mature, I would say, a, a taller um, uh, pivot is a very mature uh, sort of step in in the right direction because of the fact that uh, clients on the other end are not going to be, uh, in my sense, is that they're not going to be um, willing to just uh, um, give up uh, the control of over over their critical infrastructure to a open. Um, uh, uh, platform. So they want to have control. They want to have uh, control over the cost, over the access. And um, if they are in the ecosystem and if they like to see something on the open blockchain, and especially if the open blockchain is cheaper um, in terms of operating costs, that transition will happen eventually. Um, but in the interim, I would say, you know, Cardano IOHK is, is doing a great job of, of, of putting uh, the enterprise solutions where they belong, which is uh, where um, these entities have uh, control over you know, what goes on in their blockchain and, and allow some sort of an acclimation time to take place because it's a complex technology. It takes years to probably understand for an average person to, to, to be comfortable. Um, I mean, it took me a while, two or three months to understand why my wallet is secure. Why, why is it secure? Why am I sending money, which is real dollars to a, uh, a, a string of numbers and, and, uh, and letters and just trust that, you know, it's going to be there. Um, and uh, you know we are fortunate in the United States, uh, myself included, um, to to have a wealth of information, to have access to all these bright minds that come online and 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 explain things to us. You know these are the, these are not the it's not the same in 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 outside of the United States. You know people don't have information. They don't even know. Probably they don't have the frameworks to analyze the information uh, that. That, that comes to them. Um, so that all makes it difficult for them to, uh, to understand, um, you know, the blockchain. So if, if you if you come to them and say, oh, by the way, you have to just give up control over, over your uh, identity, over your uh, um, government administration uh, and whatnot, um, yes, it's going to be no. I mean, it's, it just doesn't work that way. Um, but if they are on the, uh, on the blockchain that talks to Cardano, and if, you know, the government of Ethiopia sees and adapt that is really interesting um, and it's only available there and if they develop it let's say within their ecosystem it wouldn't work the same way or it wouldn't have the same security guarantees which is pretty much given open open networks are the most secure ones um, then they might make a decision to transition part or you know some parts of their ecosystem into the open uh, and use ADA um, now that that is not to say that IOHK, you know, can just basically uh, uh, take everything that they say and and deliver the product and and uh, even not try to to uh, benefit the ecosystem in, in a greater way than just in our connection. I mean, one of the things that I think about is that, um, you know, there's there's two stages in in blockchain development, right? And this one is is that you, you as a client, you pay upfront for the development of the software, let's say the blockchain. And once it's developed, you have operating costs. That will be, you know, let's say that I, I have a private blockchain, you know, I'm, I'm a government of Ethiopia and whatnot. Um, one way is, is for me to run my servers, my nodes and maintain them. And the other is to outsource that to IOHK uh, and, uh, you know, hope that these guys know what they're doing. Um, even though I probably have all, you know, the, the master keys for all the nodes, but you know, the maintenance and whatnot is, is, is done by a third party. Now, in the first case where, in, in, in the case where you are given, uh, the, uh, you know, when, when you're given a, a lump sum of money to develop it, there isn't much of, of a leeway. For, for IOHK to do anything to benefit uh, the ecosystem. They just pretty much have to take it and build the, the solution. But once the solution is built, um, I believe, it's my personal belief that they can just say, hey, okay, we will maintain this network for you, but um, could you please pay us an ADA, right? And what they could do is they could just say, um, on the day of, of, of uh, payment of your invoice for IOHK, let's say, um, you just, convert the dollar amount that you owe us into ADA and transfer it to our wallet. Boom. Um, that creates that creates uh, demand right there. And imagine if there are many, many, many clients like that. Um, and you can stagger them. You can see how, how that 
uh, onboarding ca can actually push the uh, pushes the price of the ADA up in 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 capital markets in open markets. Um, so there's there's that kind of uh, uh, move that the the uh, the three entities could make in order to uh, to increase the adoption of ADA. I think that's that's the most critical part of of uh, success. Um, you know, if, if Cardano wants to be successful, it has it's the most critical factor in this uh, that it has to be adopted. It has to be adopted as a as a currency, as mean, mean, means of exchange. It has to be adopted as a platform, and one of the ways is basically, you know, why why does dollar have value? As, as Rick was asking, it's because government asks its taxes in dollars, right? And and sim, you know, in a in a very similar way, Rick, uh, I think IOHK, Cardano Foundation, and Amorgo should could could start asking for payment in ADA. Um, and that will just basically create that vortex that will start the 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 the, the chain and uh, create the circulation among the people, among the entities that are within the ecosystem. Um, it needs to be jump started by these three entities, I think, um, because otherwise, you know, I mean, I'm, I can I can uh, I, I can try to to accept, accept ADA for for my services. That that's doable too. But in in terms of uh, you know. The, the sheer volume or and and uh, in in and visibility, I think these three entities could uh, jumpstart that and uh, have a bigger effect on 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 the value of ADA down the road. So um, um, that's that's my take on it, uh, to be honest. Thanks. That was a really good take on it. So uh, Philippe, if you if you don't have any other questions along that line, I thought that was really good. I'd like to switch over to the AI part of it and how Siri technologies. And Elliot is involved with analyzing this data because UMED's output product is the information. But right. you know, how do we get that information? So, Elliot, what can you tell us about the AI? Right. Okay. So there are a lot of aspects. So, of course, you know there are a lot of factors that influence the the price of a various of various cryptocurrencies. You know, the idea of having a decentralized system. That's one. You know, that's one source of what gives it value. But then we want to. How do we make portfolio decisions based off of that? You know, there are a lot of factors that go into what makes the value higher or lower. And essentially, we want to look at all those different values and then figure out how to, you know, how they're correlated, what kind of hidden patterns are, are, are in those um, are in those variables. For example, let's say, you know, um, if the transact the number of transactions all of a sudden spikes, that's going to increase the value of the currency. And of course, the AI will, will be able to pick up on that saying, OK, historically speaking, when we've had a huge jump in transactions. The price of, let's say, Bitcoin went up considerably. Um, if you actually look back uh, on Bitcoin right before April 1st, like the le days leading up to it, there was a huge spike in uh, number of transactions. Uh, and you can find this data publicly. And then sure enough, the price went up. And historically, this has more or less been the trend. Our AI will be able to pick up on that trend and many other trends and sort of figure out which ones are important now, which ones are less important. And essentially, it will shift will take into account not only those different variables, but how much each one is influencing the price. And based off of that, it'll make a prediction saying this is how much the price should, you know, go up or down um, within some degree of error, of course. And using that, people will be able to make the smart portfolio decisions based off that information. Because there's just there's just so much data out there. How do we make sense of that data? It's too much for one person to sort of look at all these graphs and just make sense what's important now, what's going to be important later. Uh, how do we value short-term information versus long-term information? There are just too many factors for the individual to consider consistently make good portfolio decisions off of. That's where the AI part of it comes in. Okay. In, okay. in, 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 in a nutshell. Okay. Okay. So um, I want to bounce. Um, I want to ask you another question, Elliot, but I want to bounce something that Umed said earlier. And basically this, this market is so nascent and um, it doesn't seem like, you know, when you, when you're on Twitter, you have a lot of technical analyst gurus and you have a lot of gurus in this space that will, tell you the direction of of certain crypto projects, um, a majority of them are wrong. Um, and I guess some are right, but some are probably right by 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 chance and others maybe are just they, they see something that the rest of the population doesn't see. So like moving moving forward with analytics, how is this going to be because this market is all over the place and what exactly what ratios, what numbers, what X variable are you looking for? Um, to to present project to present solutions to financial institutions that are looking to make investments within the crypto space because now i i don't see major banks or major 
companies getting into blockchain because uh, the, the space doesn't really make sense now um, as far as price and what exactly moves the price up and down. If, if I'm making any sense, what are you looking for from an AI perspective? Right, of course. This is a, this is definitely a very great question, and it, it is nascent. And just like just like you said, there's not. It's it really hard to determine what factors are most significant. There are a lot. We know there are a lot of factors to consider. There's a lot of data out there, and so that relates to Bitcoin. You know, like you said, how, the number of transactions, the volume, the cost of transactions. Um, you know, how big the blockchain is. Uh, just various social media, social media sentiment, and many other factors. The idea is that each of these factors relates to the cryptocurrency space in some way. We as humans don't necessarily know exactly to what degree that that influences the price. Maybe the price is influenced in the short term, but not the long term. How long does it is it influenced for? And all we have all this data coming in. What do we do with that data? We don't essentially know what to do with that data, so we program an AI to do it for us. And so we what we, what we do is. We make it easier on ourselves because through in AI there are two two well not just two but two, there are several ways so several branches of AI that are relevant here and one of them is unsupervised learning and this is the idea where you have a bunch of data and you as an engineer or a human don't really know what you're looking for so you have an AI sort of pick up on trends that you may not necessarily have thought to program for and so the idea is we take in all this data we don't really know what we're looking for per se and yet we're still able to find some patterns and structure within the data we're, give, we're, we're given even if we have no idea what how this would have possibly correlated before and so like like you were saying some of the key variables we can have like so again transaction cost is one transaction volume is another one uh, social media sentiment, uh, let's see, b various blockchain statistics, and then you know anything else we can think of, anything that relates to the cryptocurrency of interest in some way, we can then we can then use the AI to to look at all this data and then find hidden patterns within that data and the output to the user saying, look, this is when this happens, this also tends to happen, um, and it, it, it sort of figures it out for us, even though we don't we don't know what to look for per se. That's the that's the beauty of it. We don't because it is so new. We don't really know. Exactly. We can't say with full confidence that this factor is more significant than this one. How do we quantify better? There are a lot of there's a lot of vagueness in, in, in this. So the AI sort of helps us move past the vagueness and give us some useful information to make decisions off of. In terms of uh, companies and let's say let's say focus on portfolio returns for a little bit. So let's say we have a portfolio that has you know Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, so you know and, and 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 whatnot. So so what we can do is if we have you know, a portfolio with various cryptocurrency assets, we can sort of also look at the correlation between the, the, the two assets. Like, you know, when one goes up, what happens to the other one? So aside from all the different individual statistics that I mentioned on the for the individual cryptocurrency, like, you know, transaction cost, transaction volume. So ideas we take into account the correlations of the various cryptocurrencies to, let's say, traditional stocks, the the various um, the various data out there for each individual cryptocurrency, and we sort of analyze it all together uh, to 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 be able to understand where the portfolio is going. And we just we give you know common statistics like the the the, the basic like expected portfolio returns and standard deviation. That's more in our um, you know for basic investors. And then we have more advanced investment analytics for the more seasoned investors. People. What, what, Whatever a, a more seasoned investor, a professional investor would look for, like a CFA working in, you know, in portfolios, they would look for certain metrics. We prov we provide those metrics on cryptocurrency through the use of AI, and then, and any and also all other relevant information. For example, when you consider, let's say, fiat currency, we're not interested, let's say, in, in, in you know, in, in blockchain statistics. It's not relevant to fiat currencies. So how does how do non traditional factors in the price play a role in the expected return of our portfolio we include all, all we, we're going to include all all, all of those features and so in terms of making sense of the making sense of the value well the idea is that through all this data uh, through all this data crunching and all this you know all those various computations we're able to find hidden patterns that we did not look for and these hidden patterns can make us can help us make better educated guesses on where the individual portfolio is going, where not, not just the portfolio, but the individual cryptocurrencies themselves are going as well. So there's a lot of information and the investors can pick and choose. The beauty of it is that they can pick and choose what they want to focus on. Maybe they just want to invest in one stock and, 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 fo and focus on that one stock. Maybe they want to have an assortment of different cryptocurrencies. Maybe they want to have a mixed portfolio. And by that, I mean a mix of traditional assets with crypto assets. How do and, and an investor will have all the tools at their disposal to make decisions that are appropriate to them 
based on based on based on the AI. And so, you know, we use some of the we use various you know algorithms to to, to do this. Some proprietary, and some of them are a proprietary application and more standard ones. And through the combination of those two, we we are confident we're able to produce useful information that will help the investors on average make better returns. You know, that's really interesting because um. So I'm assuming that the bigger data set you have. <clears throat> or the more time you have to input into the AI, the more accurate the output's going to be. Can you actually tell the AI and just say, all right, software, tell me you know, six months from now, where should this cryptocurrency be based off of all the data we've collected so far? Is it right? Sure, I can definitely speak to that. So definitely, uh, in, in the rule of thumb for AI is the more training data you have, the better the better uh, the prediction should be. Uh, of course, you want to when you're training it, you want to be able to test it off something. So the historical because there's so much historical data for let's say Bitcoin and Ethereum, let's say we want to train it on four years of data, and we want to test it on the last you know two years of data, and then you can the, the previous four years will be able to provide the AI with enough information to make good forecasts. In the last two years, we can test to see how well how well it forecasted versus what the data actually showed. And this is how this is how we judge how well the model will perform uh, go, going forward. Um, that's more or less how, how 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 that works. Oh well, so it allows you to validate the model and you. Exactly. That's exactly what, in the in the AI community the way it's uh, it's the training set. It would be the first, let's say, the first four years, and the, the validation set um, is the um, is the uh, the last two years. And this is essentially where we test the data. We essentially we know what the data should look like because we have the data for those two years. We want to see what the AI predicts for those two years and compare it to the actual data. And based on how it does, we'll be able to say, oh, you know, this performed pretty well. And we feel confident it can generalize well to new unseen data. And this is you know a common a common practice for machine learning. Nice. That sounds a lot more usable than like on the TAs. I often see people do this A, B, C, D, E thing. And I just go, right. well, I, right. I, I see the pattern differently than what they just explained. And I'm not even a pro. And um, <laughs> I'm like right 50% of the time and wrong 50% of the time. So I may as well flip a coin. Exactly right. Yeah. We, exactly, exactly right. So we we don't want to do that. So the idea is that for them, and what we're going to also put for our um for our models, we'll also put we we'll we're going to do our best to f to have a model which can forecast, let's say, uh, number of transactions. Let's let's say the the the, the user of our platform wants to know how the transaction volume for let's say Ethereum goes up in, in in the next six months. Let's say they want to focus on just that one aspect. We can then have a model which says. We think it's going to be here in, in six months, and it will show like a, a, a you know a graph which says this is where the price should be for the next six months for each day. And then the idea is, well, for the model, we'll we'll be able to quantify the degree of how confident uh, or the AI will have a metric which quantifies how good the model should be. Like if we feel very confident, the number would be much higher than if we feel lower. And basically, the investor can say, okay, this model is giving me a pretty uh you know pretty high. Uh, coefficient and it's, and it's going to say i think and I, this is not going to be basic linear regression by the way this is going to be um because I'm, I'm being somewhat vague here it's going to be more sophisticated and just it's going to be an advanced regression model it's not just linear it's um we're going to be using a uh, various um time series uh, time series forecast and from the time series forecast we'll be able to do um good predictions then we can quantify how good that prediction is and if the, if the prediction model is highly ranked then we can say with higher degree of confidence that this is more or less what the price should be if it feels more iffy the coefficient will be lower and if it feels not so certain it'll probably say you may as well fl flip a coin uh generally speaking you know, if we have a lot of historical data it should be pretty reliable or you know reliable to a certain to a certain degree and you can then say okay the price should be here plus or minus you know s s some amount or let's say the number of transactions should be here plus or minus some amount and then based on that information, you know, like I said, the investors can make whatever decisions they want to. You know, whether that's you know their own portfolios, maybe they just want to follow the stock, maybe they want to you know figure out, you know, maybe, maybe they're specifically interested in maybe the investor feels that the transaction volume is what's gonna affect the price. And they're just they're really set on that. So maybe they want to focus on just the transaction volume. They can look at that one individual statistic and then make decisions on their portfolio based off those statistics. Or alternatively, they can look at a whole bunch of different features and combine, you know, the various import the, the degree of importance of all those features to their own portfolio. And then there's, there's there's a lot of there's a it's it's fun because there's a, it's a huge playground of information to explore and you know over time the investors will sort of choose what, what they feel most comfortable exploring um, and you know what what just gives them the better return on portfolio but there are a lot of features available so investors can sort of pick and choose what they want and then we just want to kind of want to give them a huge toolbox uh, you know of every every tool they would possibly need and they kind of just go in there and pick which tool fits their needs best. 
Okay. Okay. Elliot, I have a follow-up question because um, this is more of a speculative question. So from what I'm gathering, it's almost like you're trying to provide certain index values to your customers. You know, when you right. go on, when you go on like Vanguard and they show you the ETFs and the mutual funds, they give you the ROI for various different years. It works a little different in blockchain because there are different variables as well. But right. moving forward, how long do we need to take? Because I've ran linear regression models. I've ran logarithmic re regression models. I've ran exponential time series. And like the R squared value for Cardano, for example, it's just not statistically significant at, right now. And right. I just don't know how long that time window will take in order for um, for things to become right. more statistically statistically significant. Right. There's certainly very, very great questions. Um, the, the, the nice thing is that, uh, so when you use linear regression models, you're sort of, you're limited in the kind of function. Like certainly there is, there's a function which describes the, the data, like this, if it describes the data. So the idea is let's say on some given day, you have this price for, let's say, you know, Ethereum. And the next day you have this price for Ethereum. There's, and then you have a, a whole history of that. There is an exact function which will describe the input output relationship of this, of the stock price to, to the day, essentially, it, it's exact. So the, when you're limiting yourself to a line, your forecast is not really good because you're saying that data is going to follow a line more or less, and that's just that's not realistic. And same with logarithmic; it's not really following a, lo a logarithmic uh, mo model at all. Thankfully speaking, though, so there are like for, let's let's say we take a neural network, right? Neural networks are known to be what are called universal function approximators, and the idea is that they can take any continuous function, which would be you know more or less true for modeling you know price data. Because um, you know we have an exact input output relationship, and you know, more or less, you know, is it's 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 not bumpy or or jaggy, just to be you know very, um, what's the word, uh, basic with it, and not 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 being very precise. So the idea is that so we can have a continuous function model the price. The idea of a neural network uh, or any universal function approximator is they can take any continuous function and model that exactly. Um, so it doesn't have to be a line. We don't even know, we don't even need to know what kind of function we're looking for. We just need to know it's continuous, which is the power of mathematics in general. We don't we're we're not limited to a specific function. We're we're essentially looking in the class of all possible functions and then finding the exact one to model the price. So when it comes to regression models, you can use a neural network to perfectly model historical data. The problem using that approach is that even though it can model the historical data perfectly, it won't necessarily generalize well to new data. And this is called the overfitting problem. This is essentially where you do too well in the training data and it won't generalize well to new unseen data. So there, there are various tricks to reduce overfitting. And some of the proprietary algorithms that I have that actually um, don't use a neural network uh, at all are going to be able to find, well, they actually, it's, I wouldn't say they were doing it all. They use a combination of neural networks and something proprietary to address the overfitting problem. And the idea here is that it will know, so they're saying, okay, the model that we have here on the training data has a certain degree of accuracy. And then we're going to say, and this way, and we also are going to forecast its ability to generalize the new data. We see the, the model is good enough. If it's, if it's too perfect, it won't be able to accurately predict where, 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 the, where the next points are. But, but if it's not perfect, if, if it's too, if it's linear, for example, that's not going to fit the data well either. So there's, there's, a, there's a, a trade off here. So the idea here is we want to find the best possible regression model using, um, it's not going to be a specific function. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a adaptive function more or less that essentially takes in parameters and it adjusts how the function you know what, what you know how how it uh, moves up and down and, and all the shifts it's going to do and based on those shifts the regression model will be some function we don't know but it will be able to describe the data well and forecast the new data so the r squared value would be more statistically significant there and that's sort of the best we can do because there is uh, there is no way, uh, to my knowledge, to have a perfect reg regression model. It's obviously an ongoing field of research, but certainly this is a better way to do it. Don't limit yourself to one individual function. Try to find, try to look for a class of functions, and then find a specific function in that class to model the function you to to model a relationship that you want to model. So, and some of my training that I did, that I did um, for my PhD studies before, because I, I was doing my PhD, and then I essentially um, took, a, I guess, a hiatus to work on Seri Tech. The, the, the story is, it's kind of, you know, a, a fun story. So I was taking a machine learning class, and then during that time, I had the prototype for some of these algorithms developed. And I thought to myself, well, I could publish a paper on it, or I can try to make some money off of it. And so then I decided, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm, I said, I'm going to just, I think, I, I don't want someone else to make money off my idea. So I said, okay, I'll work on this now for a little bit, and then eventually come back and finish my studies. But one of the fields I was interested in was, uh, 
uh, analysis. Analysis is sort of um, built off a of calculus, and this is sort of like, you know, uh, it essentially took all those ideas and generalized them uh, further. And one of the most important powers of analysis is the idea that you can abstract a lot of things for example, let's say the idea of what functions you want to look for. And so we're not going to, we're not interested in specific functions. We're interested in the classes of functions that do something useful. And the regression models are no different. And we can use these models to then forecast the prices. And so this sort of, it was, a, my ideas were inspired by this training um, to be able to do these re regression models. Um, and, then, and then using that, we're able to predict stock. And this can be applied to stock price, can be applied to any, any variable of interest that is relevant to the blockchain, relevant to cryptocurrency, can be analyzed in this way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. So, yeah. And I think it's perfect that you took a hiatus and you're awesome. you're you're going towards your own company and um, making sure that you profit as much as possible in this new space because timing is a uh, critical Everything. component. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the time you finish your PhD program, who knows, you know, like we, um, the cryptocurrency space may have already mooned and it's oversaturated. So um, we're probably a long way away from that. But PhD programs also take a long time. So, yeah. Um, I, I guess, Rick, we can um, open it up. Do you guys have uh, maybe a few more minutes um, we can discuss or what's your what, what are you looking like on time? <clears throat> no, I'm fine. I um, I think we should we could we could. Uh, maybe cover a little bit about um, uh, you know the market and what is going it's going to look like in the future. I think I had a couple of thoughts about that about institutional okay. investors coming in and whatnot. And okay. I, also, I also have one more comment to talk about this why it's a exciting time to um, for Oculent and just the why this is a very good timing in terms of where the crypto space is and why this product is very um, very very beneficial at this exact time and why AI is uh, AI and cryptocurrency is starting it now will help us set our, set up the crypto space to be more favorable to investors later on. I will have a few more comments to make about that later. Sure. Who would like to go first or what would be the best order to do that? Well, I, I, I can start. I guess. You, 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 can, you can start. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> so um, with regards to markets, I would say that uh, they're in a nascent sort of uh, stage where uh, a lot of individual investors are making their bets. Um, and and the the, the uh, difficulty here at this point is that um, uh, people often don't know what they're buying, and and I believe that in 2019, 2020, when we have avenues for institutional investors to come into the space, we will have a lot of smart money coming in, and that's when we um, we will see a lot of uh, uh, decoupling of uh, correlations. Um, that is important to, to note because. Um, when you look at the market right now, or you know, for the past few years, um, everything has a really high correlation to Bitcoin, um, and that, that has buffled me uh, for a longest period of time. Um, the only explanation I can come up with, um, looking at data so far, is that uh, Bitcoin is used as a, uh, a medium of uh, liquidity to to actually uh, enter and exit uh, positions for uh, investors, individual investors, or uh, hedge funds or whatnot. Um, and and uh, and uh, it's it's price correl price uh, movements are, are clearly correlated with uh, um, uh, uh, the the rest of the market. Now, when there's two things that need to happen, um, uh, more coins need to be added with fiat pairs, um, and second, uh, you know, custody solutions will have to come online for individual for. Uh, registered investment advisors and institutional investors to actually allocate a portion of their portfolio into these assets. When that happens, um, it will create uh, a, a huge demand for analytical platforms like the ones that Oculent is building, Oculent Skylight, uh, because it's Skylight, you can see the moon. Uh, that was the, the idea, at least. Um, 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 it will create it will create a, a demand for analytics um, because uh, in the financial world people want to know what is the uh, re potential return for uh, an investment, what its uh, risk profile. You know you can define it in standard deviation, you can define it in maximum drawdown. Yeah, there's a, a sharp ratio that people use, um, and then what's the correlation between these assets? Um, and uh, depending on what where these numbers are, uh, you know. Uh, and, and what the composition of the starting portfolio is, uh, the, the, the portfolio managers and uh, registered medicine advisors will, will make decisions for their clients to, uh, to allocate one or another percentage 
uh, uh, you know, a point of, of uh, a portfolio to these assets. Um, 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 my understanding is that these assets are really low, has, have a low, low correlation to uh, traditional assets uh, by the virtue of being completely decoupled from the financial system and, and the ebbs and flows that, that go in, in it. Um, and, and thereby they, they would be able to, uh, to provide some value, a uh, diversification value uh, at the time of high stress when uh, traditional markets are going through a turmoil. Um, so that's at least, uh, you know, the, the, the basic investment case for, for crypto assets uh, to, to be added to portfolio. But um, on the second note, what I was uh, getting at, what I was getting at was that um, the correlations will break eventually. Um, the high correlation with the Bitcoin price, I, I think there's no fundamental reason for it to exist. Uh, there's no reason to think that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Cardano needs to move in the same direction and the same magnitude that, 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 as, as Bitcoin, because these are two different kind of uh, products and they have different markets, different niche. Uh, and uh, once the institutional investors come in and they look at the narrative, they look at the development, they look at the fundamentals, they will make these calls. And as a result, the market prices will move in the, in the, right, in the same direction. So you might, you might see, uh, if there are factors that affect only Ethereum, Ethereum will only change and the rest is not going to change. And that will basically signal the maturation of the market where you can say that, okay, well, I can definitely trust the, the signals coming off the market right now. Um, because if, if Ethereum is doing something and it has nothing, no connections with Cardano and Cardano is not affected, then it means that people or the 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 players in the market know what they're doing. They know, they know what they're buying. So the, the types of news that affect other currencies, uh, uh, one currency will not affect the other currency. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to that period of time to, 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 to arrive. And, and when that does arrive, um, portfolio uh, solutions like that one that we are developing at Oculent, Oculent Skylight, uh, will will be there to pr produce the meaningful insights for individual investors and institutional investors uh, alike to make uh, intelligent investment decisions. And obviously we will use AI to augment uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, um, the decision-making capability of, of our clients, uh, wh whoever wants to subscribe to that part of the portfolio management solution. That sounds good. That's a, that's a great response. That's a, that's a great, um, that, that's great. That's great. And I, I think that you said it, I, I think you hit the nail right on the head when you said when smart money enters, things will decouple. And I think the viewers should recognize that smart money is going to flow into smart projects and it's not going to be any other way. So um, w when a f financial analyst or whoever you work with on a day to day basis, whoever the big players in this game are, are, are when they come in, they're going to be looking at GitHub. They're going to be looking at all these different metrics. They're going to be looking at the talent pool. It's, it's not going to be, they're not going to be investing millions and possibly billions of dollars in, in crypto projects or blockchain projects that have no, no, um, developer talent. They have no goals. They don't have a roadmap. They're not, making any moves it's 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 going to be interesting i don't know how far we are out from that um is there a a time scale you mentioned 2019 later 2020 is there a time scale where we can say you know the the players are going to move in in your in your opinion yeah um <clears throat> so i mean looking at the developments in in this industry you know i could say that um, uh, uh, you know, Fidelity is coming in, uh, back this kind of, uh, sort of making the right moves and, and signaling sort of, uh, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to predict all these, all these, uh, timings, but, um, I hope, I hope that by the end of 2019, we will have all these avenues open up the, the tough, the tough thing, I think the most, uh, difficult thing is to, to convince the legislators, um, to come up with some sort of framework that will put the minds of, of uh, you know, the watchdogs at ease and and uh, have some frameworks to evaluate and protect the investor investors. Because I mean, like, let's face it, there's still a lot of uh, two thousand coins. I don't know. Um, I'm not buying Putin coin anytime soon. That's that's for sure. Um, there's a lot of things that are not, uh, um, you know. They're, they're outright scams, and 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 investors need to be mindful of these uh, of of these uh, 
uh, coins. But um, that being said, um, I, I I would say that the top 20, top 30 sort of coins are going to be prominent coins that uh, people might want to consider to add into their portfolio. Um, uh and and all all depending on subject to due diligence right you know they have to look at you know who's behind these talents and uh, whether the price actually is real or whether it's just two or three uh um uh exchanges that are inflating it um and that's where you know our the value added of our portfolio is going to come in because we are going to uh present the user with uh realistic as much as possible realistic uh, uh volumes prices etc cetera, etc cetera, so they they can they can make a uh you know an informed decision um so yeah um on the fundamental value of 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 uh of um the platforms right i wanted to to just uh clarify one question um the if you look at assets especially uh, in traditional assets right you know let's just say equity or bonds right the way they are valued is is, is against the future future cash flows so the way it's valued is that you like look at what if, if you're buying a uh, a stock right you estimate how much free cash flows you're gonna have after you know paying down your debt and taxes and everything uh, to your equity holders. And then you discount it by a rate, which what we call the discount rate, which takes into consideration the risk that you take as an investor. And then you do a discount and you run a couple of scenarios and say, this is a high, uh, you know, the, the optimistic scenario, this is a pessimistic scenario, and this is a base case. And then sometimes you take a, an average of those and then say, well, I mean, the 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 uh, the, the value should the, the fundamental value of a, a stock should should be somewhere between these ranges. Um, some people basically put uh, some uh, you know uh, uh, technical analysis indicators in their um, momentum or what they call momentum. Some some put uh, the uh, the uh, uh, what should we call it the um, uh, multiples. You know what what other competitors are trading at. So um, this is the way that traditional financial institutions, traditional financial analysts, and traditional um, uh, markets have always valued assets, um, financial assets. Now, it's completely different when it comes to currencies, right? The currencies are basically are driven by supply and demand. And, and you know, if you, if you strip down the supply and demand, it's driven by, uh, you know, if you take the fiat currencies, right? Dollar is driven by... Uh, the, the, the demand for dollar, right? A global demand for dollar. And that's basically backed by what? Uh, it's backed largely by the fact that, you know, there is a, a bunch of people, a bunch of countries out there in the world uh, that accept dollar as a as their payment currency for free oil, for instance, right? That's a huge, basically, demand for for United States dollar. And also because, you know, the United States uh, uh, dollar is, is so prominent in, in the current financial system. And uh, and uh, every every time you have to do do the transaction, let's say from Zimbabwe dollar to uh, the neighboring country, you know uh, some other, uh, you know the, the dinar, uh, for instance, you have to go through one of these major currencies to do the conversion. So um, that creates value, um, and that's the way that the financial system is run. You know that's the way that uh, you know the, the the transfers and the, the conversions work. So. Um, and in, 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 in the case of uh, cryptocurrencies, for instance, right, you know, that demand will have to come from somewhere, right? Um, you know, I, I was talking to you about the use case of, uh, of cryptocurrencies as pure currency, you know, when there's something that is in distress, the country is in distress, you just want to, uh, you know, sell all your belongings and put it in, on a, something that's not very, that doesn't uh, weigh uh, 15 pounds like gold and uh, and and uh, be on your way if, if you're in a, in a distressed situation uh, Charles mentions you know people in Syria if, if you're in a need of money and uh, you want to just get away you know these these uh, networks are perfect but <clears throat> there is a, with with regards to 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 uh, um, platforms there's a, a, another dimension to it which is the dApps, the dApps that provide useful calculations, the dApps that provide useful services on the decentralized network uh, that uh, produce value for businesses, for people uh, that will in turn use them uh, to, to build their businesses. Um, so if, if the dApp, for instance, is so powerful that it could, uh, you know, calculate the the you know to do the same calculations that is necessary to to uh to power the the uber app for instance right you could have a decentralized version of uber 
on 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 the blockchain and and i i really like um the proof of stake for that or uh uh you know uh, for that particular case is because um and 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 um, I would say that the, uh, uh, the 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 stake stake pool mines are going to be very very instrumental, and uh, I would say they're going to be the, the the center of value creation within the Cardano network. Um, that uh, you know the way that the architecture right now works is that you know you you, you stake your coin and then you uh, you know get some rewards, and that's the limited view of 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 these stake pools, right? Um, in the long run, these stake pools will offer uh, additional benefits. Um, they might have a, a, a DAP. They might use those uh, fees to run a DAP that will uh, provide some sort of service to the community, for instance, right? And here in DC, we are thinking about, uh, since we are not getting any money from the Cardano Foundation, we could basically say, we're running this uh, um, stake pool and part of these uh, fees that that are we are we are charging are going to uh, to go to uh, meetups, for instance, you know, within the uh, you know DC community, uh, or we could uh, uh, provide um, you know a discounted research on Oculent uh, website. You know, if you stake with us, you get a discount, for instance. Um, those are the things that uh, the the stake pool found, uh, the stake pools will will be able to provide to the community. Uh, at at uh, at a cost um, that that is digestible for many, um, but going back but going back to uh, the fundamental uh, value, so the the uh, um, platforms they don't lend themselves well to discounted uh, cash flow analysis. The but um, there is a way to to calculate that and and. Uh, Take that value and say, uh, let me just back up a little bit. There is a way to um, quantify the cost reduction from employing uh, um, blockchain instead of the current IT solutions. Um, let's say that you know you are a country that doesn't have uh, an extensive banking uh, system, and you want to create a banking system that is based on the blockchain. Um, you could use uh, the, the Cardano's blockchain to put uh, your banks as nodes in it and uh, be able to uh, to basically give your population bank account and uh, and and release your currency on a virtual network, um, and that uh, would be much cheaper, I would say, than than creating everything from scratch and uh, doing it the traditional way. Um, and I'm I'm at this point I'm writing a, a an article I'm I'm collecting information about writing an article about um, that goes into the um, the details of of how much the financial infrastructure in the United States in particular costs us uh, and what if you know just a thought experiment what if all of it was was uh, based on blockchain how much would it cost I mean. Um, 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 Charles mentioned that it will take the the whole entire network is going to take uh, the the power of a heater to run, um, and and have the same security guarantees as, as Bitcoin. Let's say um, that is so 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 cheap uh, in terms of um, maintaining and and uh, and, and uh, operating a network. Um, just just think about. Uh, the amount of money that will be released um, to to do other things, to uh, you know, um, and uh, your infrastructure would would be as secure and and as efficient as as it is today, but uh, it would cost a fraction of uh, of of of, uh, of of money, a small fraction of it, and uh, your money. Um, let's say that if there was a uh, you know United States digital coin. Um, uh, the Federal uh, Reserve would, at any point in time, know where each dollar is to the last cent, and uh, and uh, would be able to adjust the interest rates as it sees feed fit um, on on a, on a real time basis, rather than looking at six months uh, back and say, okay, well, this is what happened in the past six months. Let's just uh, adjust it right now and hope hope that we get it right this time. Um, so. Um, those are the benefits of of, uh, of blockchain, and in in that regard, if you step back and say, uh, what can blockchain, uh, from a fundamental point of view, replace in the current system? Um, and if you 
come to an agreement that um, given the assumptions that we have uh, for our analysis that you know blockchain is a viable solution for um, let's say financial systems which is what what uh, Cardano is trying to achieve for instance and given the fact that uh, the the political powers of, of the day are okay with uh, using it or using the the private version of it or whatnot um, then you can just basically say okay well in the current form uh, it takes let's say, five or six seven billion of dollars to to run this block particular blockchain uh, uh, to um no, it, it let's say that it takes incumbents about six or seven billion dollars to to uh to currently run things as they are but if we transfer that into a blockchain that cost goes down to let's say uh you know a hundred or two hundred uh thousand dollars a year that is a lot of savings uh and to capture that, um, the Cardano community or the Cardano, uh, you know, uh, network could say, um, while we're saving you eight million $8 billion dollars, you know, um, you basically in 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 response to that, you, we we want, you know, you could just price the the transactions in, in on your blockchain so that uh, you capture part of that value savings that you're giving to your client. So uh, instead of just uh, uh, you know enjoying the the benefits at the cost they will have to pay some premium let's say you know 10 or 15 million dollars uh per year uh to the blockchain let's say the cardano open blockchain uh through the network fees that would support ada um and that way you could you could make calculations reasonable calculations about what the value of ada from a discounted cash flow point of view is going to be um which is, you know, a new framework that I'm trying to work and and solidify um, in 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 my research. Um, so in 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 our platform again, we will have um, a fundamental research conducted by CFA charter holders. I'm gonna probably onboard uh, a couple of more as we uh, uh, ramp up, um, and people will will have access to fundamental data um, uh, that will be uh, discussed in in, in in these report in depth. Uh, in addition to the the price data. Okay, okay, fascinating, fascinating. I want to hop over to Elliot, and Elliot, why don't you give us some um, some of your final thoughts and where 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 you are? Of course, right. I wanted to just say that uh, I think it's a really exciting time for crypto. I think just if we look at let's say Bitcoin's price in the last just really two months, it's really gone up a lot. And like Guman was saying, a lot of these cryptocurrencies are very closely correlated with Bitcoin. And I think that my my I guess understanding of that always was that people don't fully trust the crypto space. So people feel that Bitcoin's doing well, everything, every other cryptocurrency is automatically doing well. But when that stops happening, like he was saying, it'll be a more mature market uh, when you know, smart money starts coming in. And I really think that because because there is so much already in terms of data relating to cryptocurrencies, whether you know that being raw data or you know social media trends or just you know various you know opinions of experts there's a list there's so much data and we have to find some way to, to, to sort through it. and that's where the ai part of it comes in because there's too much for any you know even group of individuals to do so i really think as we move forward uh, ai will be very critical for uh, cryptocurrency development and that will just extend not just a cryptocurrency but any application of blockchain because of security features uh, you know obviously we don't want any as, as these as cryptocurrencies get you know more developed we don't want anyone to try and find uh, you know, security flaws uh, in, 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 you know, our, our well, actually, let me backtrack. We don't want, because right now, when it comes to securing our finances, you know, we always hear about these data breaches. Like, you know, you know, some company was hacked and people's financial records were compromised. And I do think that having, moving to blockchain in general, in general, just would solve so many financial problems like that, making really, making it very difficult to, uh, hack into people's, you know, money or government's money or any or anything along those lines. So I think it's a really exciting time for Oculent to launch because we are sort of uh, ahead of the curve in that sense because we already realize the need for a, a central platform for cryptocurrency where we understand that AI need, is needed to sort through all the data. We also understand the importance of the blockchain technology itself for securing transactions and then anything else we want to keep secure. Um, and so as, as, as these technologies start to develop further, it becomes even more important that we understand how to how all these factors play play together. So I just really think it's an exciting time for, for Oculent, for the crypto space in general. And uh, I, do, I think it's going to be in a very good place going forward. 
Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, so that was a great description. Um, I don't have anything else, Philippe. We had uh, one Reddit question, and that was uh, where did the companies get their names from? They like the name Oculent. Where'd you get the name Oculent? Yeah. So uh, it's um, I had a uh, um, I, I I had to look for the name, and uh, all the stuff that I wanted to to name my company was taken. So I had to come up with something that didn't exist. So the oculent uh, is just a made-up word. Uh, it's it's a play to depict um, uh, uh, being observant. Uh, so oculent is just has it's, it's sort of a, a reference to uh, you know uh, Oculus, you know uh, you know eye, and oculent uh, is basically being uh, very astute or observant to to. And it, which which is a uh, a feature or a uh, character uh, that you need to have uh, in order to provide value for clients that are looking for uh, uh, you know um, good analytical uh, information. Yeah, and you know what? It's a very eloquent name as well. And so I got to thank, thank you, you guys. I've learned so much today from both of you. It's an incredible learning experience. Uh, so thank you, Elliot, for coming on. Thank of course. You for coming thank on. you for having me. All right, you bet. And so uh, I'm going to hand over to Philippe. Philippe, see if we got any last words. Okay, sounds good. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to this episode of the Cardano Effect. If you're watching this and you like what we're doing, please consider hitting subscribe. If you love what watch this and you don't like what we're doing, hit subscribe as well. This way you can keep a tabs on us, whatever the case may be. Um, I want to thank I want to thank both of our guests today, uh, Umed from Oculent, and we have Elliot from Seri Technologies. So we're going to be putting their social handles and all the appropriate information in the in the description below. In conclusion, choose wisely, choose your crypto projects wisely, choose your investments wisely. I know that a lot of people, I know it's uh, common place in the crypto community to say, oh, don't invest more than you afford you can afford to lose. You know, I don't fall into that category. I think I'm investing more than I can afford to lose. But, you know, that's not financial advice. But, you know, you do what you have to do. But pick the smart projects and pick projects that are mathematically rigorous and they have some kind of procedure. And there's 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 substance behind the projects, because when the smart money comes in, uh, you're either going to win or you're going to lose. And this could be lo this could be a loss, but we take statistics and we take the math behind it. We take the science behind it and we're giving ourselves the best po possibility to win. So take that as you want. Uh, once again, this is not financial advice. And once again, thank you for tuning in to the Cardano Effect podcast, episode 29. We look forward to seeing you guys, seeing everyone in this community on episode 30. And um, until the next time. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.